Good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Isabel de Carries, and I am the Chair of Trustees at Moray House Trust. Very warm welcome. This is our first virtual event. Please bear with us because we are new to this. Uh, particularly warm welcome to, uh, I believe we have some of um, not just our regulars from Guyana joining us, but also some of Ron's um, friends, family and contemporaries from St. Lucia and uh, further afield. Um, in addition, I think we have what I call the savory devotees. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so those who are lucky enough to um, lay claim to uh, one of Ron's paintings. Those of us from Guyana tend to forget that Ron spent almost 40 years in St. Lucia. A colleague of his there recalls my first painting purchased with my first adult paycheck at age 17, what? the savory petroglyph. I enjoy it afresh each day. This seems a fitting note on which to hand over to Al Crichton. All right, thank you, Isabel. And uh, welcome to everyone. Um, and uh, welcome to the Ron Savory, a Guyanese quest. A, uh, a word or two to explain the format for this event before we actually get into it. I will begin with a short introduction. And the presenter, Alim Hossein, will then give his talk. Then afterwards, we will invite questions and comments from the floor. Now, now Ron Savory was a household word in Guyana. Uh, he was part of the second wave of Guyanese artists who emerged in the 1950s. He was a very active intellectual who shared friendships with many of the leading art lights of the young independent Guyana and helped to set the intellectual foundation for Guyana's in the, uh, development. Ron was active in a number of fields, including broadcasting, theater, and music. But he's most remembered for his groundbreaking paintings of the Guyana hinterland, which became his cherished subject and lifelong possession. Savory connected immediately and naturally to the vastness of the, Guyana, of, of, of the Guyana savannas and the play of light and shadow in the Guyana jungle. So different from what he had been accustomed to on the coastland. The same quest connected him to the ideas of the emerging Guyanese and Caribbean writers whose works he paid homage to through his paintings. He was stirred by the idea of the existence of pre Columbian civilizations in the Americas, and he explored this in many of his paintings. In Ron Savory, Guyana had an original questing artist. In his later years, he lived in St. Lucia, but this quest never left him. We are going to hear an analysis of the work of Ron Savory from Alim Hossein, who, he, who is our presenter. And Alim is a senior lecturer in the, in the Department of Language and Cultural Studies at the University of Guyana. He lectures in linguistics and has also lectured in literature and art. He has a longstanding interest in art and culture and has been publishing articles on Guyanese art in the respected fabric news for over 30 years. He has been a member of many national committees on cultural matters. He's a member of the management committee for the Guyana Prize for Literature, and he is also currently chairman of the Guyana Visual Art Competition and Exhibition, which is Guyana's premier 
National Art Exhibition. So we have heard a background to both the focus of this event, the artist Ron Savory, and the, the, the guest lecturer who is going to make the presentation on Ron Savory, a Guyanese quest. It is now my great honor to invite Alim Hussein to make his presentation. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, welcome to this discussion on Guyanese artist Ron Savory. Um, I want to add my words of welcome to you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, whether you're here in Guyana or across the Caribbean or further afield. And I see some persons who um, have known Ron and worked with him, um, Stanley Greaves, uh, certainly one of those persons. Um, welcome, Stanley. I'm glad to have you here. Um, before I actually begin, I would like to thank Isabel de Caries and all the persons at Moray House. Um, Isabel in particular for setting me this task of speaking on Ron Savory, um, which set me uh, gathering my information on him. I had done some interviews with him back in the 1990s. I didn't know him while uh, he was active as an artist, um, but by the 1990s, he had left Guyana and um, came back to some exhibitions. And so I was able to have some interviews with him and uh, did some articles on him. So thanks for setting me that task, uh, which has now resulted in this um, talk. Thanks also for the persons, uh, Kieran, Joan, uh, for helping with the technical matters in getting this talk through. And thanks for all for um, sharing. Um, the talk is actually rather timely um, because Ron was born on, on November 21. And so this is close to his birthday. Um, so we can look at this as a kind of um, birthday tribute to him. My the talk uh, this evening, uh, it's gonna be fairly straightforward and introductory. I'm going to look at his life. I'm going to look at his work in context. We are going to look at the art um, since we don't have a real physical setting. Um, I put together something that we can look as though we are actually looking at one of his paintings at least. And then I will consider his contribution to Guyanese art and culture. So uh, let's begin. One of the interesting things about Ron Savory is that while he was a very active artist and intellectual and an innovator in Guyanese art and so all of that, um, he was not that well known and not that well remembered here in um, Guyana. Looking through the books, uh, persons mentioned Stanley Greaves, Philip Moore, um, Aubrey Williams, and so on, but not many of them mention or remember um, Ron Savory. And this lack of recognition was something that Savory himself um, felt. Um, and his daughter, Denny Savory, who wrote a tribute to him um, and published it in the Starbrook News and other places, said he always spoke about the lack of appreciation for his art throughout the Caribbean, he always felt underappreciated. And Savory himself, he also discussed himself, for example, when he came back uh, during a talk at Castellani House, um, he mentioned that and he gave an example when in 1969-70, the, he had done a mural for the Pegasus Hotel, a mural based on the Guyana jungle. And um, after not very long, the Pegasus, uh, redecorated their foyer, it was in the foyer of the Pegasus, and they painted it over as though it was of no um, consequence. So uh, he felt 
that he didn't get the kind of recognition um, that he deserved. And not just personally, but I think that he, I think he felt a third world artist as a whole um, didn't get that kind of recognition. And um, he made many jottings on this. Now, now, this is interesting because he was intellectually alive and he moved in the highest intellectual circles, the, the, the literati and glitterati of his time. Uh, he was active in many, many, many activities apart from being an artist. He was involved in broadcasting. He was a civil servant, musician, basketballer, radio producer, many, many things. Uh, but he's best known as an artist. But the thing is that around 1974, he gave up everything else that he was doing to focus on art. And so you can imagine how badly he felt about the, the lack of recognition that he felt um, was meted out to him. He was born to Clarine Jure and Neil Savory on November 21, 1933, the youngest of four boys. And he had his secondary education at Queen's College where he graduated in 1951. And there he would have come under the tutelage of the great E.R. Burroughs, who was art master at the school at that time. Um, his mother and his aunt uh, liked doing needlework. So there was some creative activity in the home and his eldest brother um, won art prizes at QC and in the later Guyanese art group for his art. He lived in Borda in a large house with his aunts, uncles and cousins in a kind of extended family. And there um, he had access to the library of one of his aunts who went on to be one of the first females to win the Guyana scholarship. I don't know if this is Elsa Govaya. I know there were about three females who by the early 1940s had won Guyana scholarships and Elsa Govaya was one of them. And I'm not sure whether um, she was the, the aunt. Um, if I do some more digging, I'd probably find out the family collection. So there was a kind of active, good family circle a kind of creative circle and intellectual activity um, growing up. After leaving school, he did several jobs and then he joined the public service, working in the Lands and Mines Department. He was posted to Kamarang in Mazaruni as a clerk to the Assistant District Commissioner in 1959, and he worked there until 1962. In 1960, he married Sheila Hancock. She was a librarian from Borobese. And um, they moved up to Kamarang in the Masaruni area, um, which would be a very important part of his life and his artistic development. After Kamarang, he moved, he worked in Lethem for a short period between January and September 1964. And then he moved back to Georgetown, resigned from the civil service and was appointed as admin officer with the British Council in 1965. And in this role with the British, British Council, uh, he was involved in media and cultural promotion, et cetera. And I think he was also attached or close to the USIS, which is the United States Information Service, um, which, was, which at one time was headed by um, Basil Hines and uh, was doing culture extension work in arts and music and so on. In 1968, he did a stint with the BBC and this was a kind of preparation um, for local cultural development, working with engineers, architects, curators and so on in fields related to broadcasting and development and cultural development and all of that. And then he returned and he worked with the Ghana Broadcasting Service, uh, GBS, which was at one time BGBS. And I think later on became GBC, Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. Um, he worked at GBS from 68 to 74. 
Now, the GBS was one of the two main radio stations. The other one was Radio Demerara, which was linked to the Rediffusion Group of Barbados. But the GBS was a local homegrown. And this is important too. And if it is important that Savory was working with the GBS rather than Radio Demerara, because GBS was the local on the ground, energetic, creative, locally linked um, station uh, in the broadcasting arena of Guyana. He was involved in the theater guild. He assisted with lights and sound. He had a radio show where he played and talked about jazz. Um, I understand that he was also um, playing steel pan and he took part in an important um, composition, the Stabrook Fantasy, which was a composition by Cicely de Nobrica. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Cicely in a little minute, in a minute. So the symposium steel band and Savory um, played in that, at least in the production of the Stabrook Fantasy in 1956. Now, Cicely de Nobrica, that's a link to the Tate group and Stanley Greaves will know much about this. Now, this was a group of young and probably older persons, Helen, Helen and Clement Tate. Um, there was Dorothy Tate, there was um, Jabez Tate, Dr. Jabez Tate, Dr. Horace Tate, Cicely de Nobrega, Hugh Sam, uh, these two persons in music, Michael Jilks in literature, Ken Carsby in, in drama and theater, and Mark Matthews and Ricardo Smith, Stanley Greaves in, and others in painting art. Um, this, was a, this was an intellectual center which nourished young people um, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, Guyana. And Savory was very much part of this intellectual, artistic, creative group. But nevertheless, he remained he remained committed to his art during all of these different things that he did. In fact, he sold his first painting in 1958 and he had exhibitions and shows almost every year. Um, he was involved with the British Council and the USIS, which as I said earlier, and he held his shows um, under their patronage and with them. His first one man exhibition was with the Ghana Society um, that is somewhere, I think, by the uh, St. George's Cathedral, or, or sorry, the, the museum, west of the um, Ghana Museum in 1959. And he showed works from his time at Camerang in 1961. So he went to Camerang, did his paintings, got this revelation and came back to Georgetown in 1961. And along with some other persons like Stanley, Emerson Samuel, Michael Leela, held an exhibition in 1961 at the Bukhars Universal Building, which is now Guyana Stores. He got wider acclaim after that in 1967. He exhibited, he exhibited in Port of Spain. He also did shows in England, in Dominica, Barbados, St. Lucia. And of course, he continued showing with the Guyanese art groups that emerged and had exhibitions every year that we'll talk about a little later. He also um, exhibited with them every year. So he was a, he was a quite engaged, um, committed person. In 1970, he was invited to coordinate the Mountain of the Art exhibitions for the first ever Carifesto 72. This was a huge um, show, 36 exhibitions across Guyana, featuring 14 other Guyanese artists, plus artists from the Caribbean featuring 500 odd paintings, sculptures, and so on from 11 countries, um, a huge exhibition. He also did some stints teaching art at the Ghana School, which was run at Tate House by Helen Tate at St. Margaret's on Camp Street and the Cyril Potter College of Education, which at that time would have been in Kingston. Um, he wrote, he made his scribbles, um, things that he did not publish, um, but he did write about the, the condition of the third world artist. Um, and I think he had something called the, the wanderings of a third world artist. 
But at some point, given all of this activity, all of these things that he was doing, he decided that it was time to realize his dream and become a full-time artist. And that came in 1974 when he resigned from the GBS and um, started working full-time as an artist in Guyana. And in January, 1980, he moved to St. Lucia, um, establishing a studio there where he did uh, his paintings and commissioned work and picture framing and um, things like that. I think he might have gone to Barbados after leaving Guyana for some brief time, but he eventually settled in St. Lucia and he continued working, exhibiting at local festival and events such as Cari Festa, Art Creators in Trinidad, Carib Art, Dom Festa, and as I said, doing um, commissioned work. He did maintain contact with Guyana in, in the 1990s. He was contracted to do artwork for the Guyana Bank of Trade and Industry in Water Street. And those paintings you can still see on the walls. In 1991, he was commissioned um, according to his thought, he was commissioned to do some prints and work for Pegasus Hotel. I don't know if this commission was done um, I, and, and if there are works there um, by him. He returned in October 1993 for a two week exhibition at the Hatfield Foundation. And then in 1996 for an exhibition at the National Gallery. And while there he did um, one of the things that he developed, uh, what he called his collaboration, and he did a he did an on the spot painting based on a paint based on a poem by Ian Macdonald, and I'll show you a little bit about that just now. And his last exhibition was Evocations and Caribbean Literature at the National Gallery Castellani House in 2010, and these were paintings that were uh, stimulated by his readings of. Caribbean literature. So his connections, his collaborations, as he called them, with um, Caribbean writers, not just artists. And he died in St. Lucia in 2019. So now I'd want to look a little bit at the context. Um, his artistic, historical uh, context um, in Guyana. Now, he came of age at a time when um, Ghana itself was going through its own political independence, which was matched by a remarkable cultural upsurge. I think that there was no period in Guyana where we had such a meeting of artists, writers, painters, dancers, musicians, etc., coming out of people like that group um, around Tate House. And this is from the um, 1950s and 60s, and you can even push it back to the 1940s when political groups and so on started um, being formed. He was part of this ferment, this pre-independent and post-independent ferment, uh, an intellectually alive and engaged person. And he believed passionately in Guyana and the Caribbean. And this drove his exploration of our landscape and our roots. Uh, it was an exciting period in our history. We had local political parties. Um, he finished high school in 1951. Guyana had its first universal adult suffrage elections in 53. The PPP was elected, but 133 later, suspended by the British government. And the PPP itself would soon split around 1957 into two groups. So all of that politically was happening. Attention was turned to 1966, to independence. There was Guyanizing of the public service and businesses. That is, um, Guyanese people were taking over the, the reins of business and industry and the civil service and so on in management and middle management positions. Uh, there was the emergence of a working class. Um, Critchlow had his labor unions going and the Guyanese working class had become conscious, had been conscious for a long time. 
and were you know, figuring out what was their role in the new Guyana and the new politics. So it was a time of nationalism, anti-colonialism, intellectual ferment and searching. And parallel to all of that, there was a local intelligentsia and artists. You had writers such as Martin Carter, Seymour, Wilson Harris, who had been publishing from poems in the 1950s. Um, Seymour had founded Kai Kovron in 1945. Karu had published Black Midas and other books, and Wilson Harris was getting into novels and writing and published, would publish Palace of the Peacock a few years later. And now remarkably also Guyanese art had been emerging. And we'll go through a little bit of history of this from the end of the 1920s. The British artists had been uh, nurturing um, Guyanese artists and they formed the British Guyana Arts and Crafts Society in 1931, which accommodated the expatriate artists and nurtured local talent. And later on from 1944, the British Council entered the picture and um, started providing magazines and talks by visiting artists and so on. And so opened a window into modern developments into European art. Um, at this time, the artists who were emerging were people like Moschett and Burroughs, Pang, Antrobos, Cummings, and Sharples. So these were the pioneers, the, the first wave of Guyanese artists. And I'm indebted to all of this history to people like Stan Lee and Evelyn Williams and others who were living that history. So the pioneers were developing and there was a great influence of the European school, the British school of landscape painting among this um, first generation. And from the British school, which was mainly focused on painting, uh, that is why perhaps painting is one of the major arts in Guyana. And so these were paintings, very atmospheric and so on. In 1934, however, the pioneers began to turn to things local and to differentiate themselves. And E.R. Burroughs writing in 1952 said the, you know, the, there was a reaction to this and the Guyanese artists were adding a flair of Guyanese modernism to the art. And they started focusing on local subjects, local landscape and people and using different techniques. Now I'd look at two paintings that I managed to get. Both happened to be from Archie Sharples and we look at the difference in approach. Now this is one, this is from N. Moore, a painting of N. Moore. And this is very much like a Dutch landscape painting with wide vistas and great trees, you know, great gnarled looking trees and open wide land and the cattle grazing there with huge clouds, like Constable clouds, you know, from the English painter um, John Constable. So it looks very much like a Dutch English pastoral kind of landscape. But then look at this one from around 1950 which is more a Guyanese kind of landscape. You have the flamboyant trees, you have an even bright light, you have the shadows, you have local people, and you have a kind of different kind of composition where you have a di diagonal bisecting the, um, the, the painting. So these were the kinds of experiments the artists were doing. Um, the Guyanese interest in art grew and they formed their own art classes, such as the Guyanese Art Group around 1945. And then they work in people's free art class. Now notice the title, Working People. So this was art for the masses, art for anyone like, like say, these aunts who were interested in needlework and so on, um, could, all have, could all join these classes. And so this was started by Burroughs and others, and it nurtured local talent. Later on, the name, the, the word free was dropped from the name and it became the Working People's Art class. So Seri joined that class in 1957. And among the people that were there were Broodhagen, Basil Hines, and Edna Hart, and Dennis Williams. And later on, Seri himself, Stanley Greaves, Donna Locke, Leela, Aubrey Williams, and Evanson Samuels. Now, this is the second wave. The, uh, who will take the art into the 1960s and 70s and 80s and so on. So, so this is the second generation and they were aware of 
modern movements like Impressionism and Cubism and so on, which the pioneer artists had started using. And, but these new artists had to deal with now some technical matters of identity and subject matter and so on. And um, identity and subject matter and technical matters such as light and color within the landscape, within the Guyanese landscape. In 1952, Burroughs reflected on this, E.R. Burroughs, and he said, we can no longer express ourselves in the idiom of naturalism. We wish rather to interpret a new way of life, which we have discovered to be more sincere and satisfying. So this was a call to arms for the Guyanese artists. So this was the climate and tradition in which Sayer rejoined the working people's art class. And he held his first exhibition in 1959. And he said his subjects were stevedores, local people, the rural landscape, and look at his figures washing in the creeks and so on, and flowers. So out of this developed some of the things that later formed part of his work. His anti-colonialism, which later linked up with Ivan Van Sertima's theory of pre-Columbian pre American societies. His interest in the third world artists, and he was writing on the ramblings of a third world artist and so on. Um, his collaborations with Guyanese and Caribbean writers and his artistic quest, as Burroughs put it, for a more sincere and satisfying art that he was, that, that was his quest. He was active in a range of activities, um, a group of friends, the Tate group that I spoke about with Jilks and Clement Tate and Sam and Greaves and the others. And these were the people who were setting the trends in broadcasting, literature, music. As I said, it was a efflorescence of Guyanese art and culture. And we can see, we can look at one of his early paintings now, Camerang. These, when, he, when he went to Camerang and he painted, we can look at um, how his art shared, how the quality of art he had before he got into his landscape period. So this is the first painting I'm going to show. Um, camera, we can see, we can see totally different from realistic painting. Um, well composed, look at the color, the dark brown of the Guyanese people. But we can see some of his favorite techniques, the scratching and the heavy painting and the loose kind of background. So we have here a painting of Guyanese workers um, bent over in their work, um, trying to make a living. This is the guy in the subject and um, shown in a bright, flat painting um, with realistic use of Guyanese um, skin tone and so on. And we can look quickly at two of the other artists who also did innovative work. All are working class people and all of them were reflecting and get time and speaking to the country in their own ways. So we had Savory reflecting the working class. We have here Stanley Greaves who did a series, People of the Garden City. And this is one of the paintings from 1962. We can see how different it is, more organized, well composed, muted colors, you know, a more modernistic kind of drawing technique with use of lines and all of that. And then we have Aubrey Williams, um, which is atmospheric, cosmic exploration of Guyana, the interior, and um, Latin America, South America history and cosmology. So these are the artists that emerged. We can move quickly to his art. Now, the change from the stevedores that I showed you um, to the landscapes and so on that he is very famous for happened when he went to the interior to Kamaram. Uh, he spent three years here from 59 to 62. And he was fascinated by the landscape and the petroglyphs at, in Baimadai. And he developed now a, a way of painting using the petroglyphs 
Now, he was perhaps, perhaps the first Guyanese artist to do so, but as we'll discuss later, this is not, this is contested, but he certainly was among the first. So one of the paintings that he did is called Bowman. Now we have a figure here in the kind of Amerindian stick figure style. But what I want you to notice is that it's not just copying a kind of figure, but using it to divide up the picture plane, to use it as an element of composition. Um, the texture is the same, this heavy texture, but using the lines of the figure as a way of organizing the space of the painting. And here we have another one where we have, again, the picture space being echoed in a number of lines with the same kind of um, indigenous kind of painting, as even probably slightly African um, way of um, creating the image. So in the format of his time as an intelligent, aware person, he was very interested in an authentic way of um, capturing Guyana in both. A, and so going to the interior was both a cultural and an artistic moment for him. It was cultural because it brought him face to face with the petroglyphs, which was something that had existed for thousands of years in Guyana before Columbus or any one of us had been here. So he had evidence of a pre-existing Guyanese culture. And then he is credited with using it in his art, as I showed you just now. But there were many other, there were others, particularly Stanley Greaves, who had started even earlier from 1958-59. Donna Locke and Aubrey Williams, um, who had started using indigenous motifs, but they felt that um, as not being indigenous people themselves, I think they felt that they could not genuinely um, use these works and they didn't want to use them just as a matter of um, style. Um, so this was a huge change. The interior landscape itself now had an influence on, on him. So as, as he said to me in 1966, it was a culture shock, which he took some time to recover from. The landscape was basically the, the dwarfing man. Man was not important. And you could see this in his work where the human figure becomes very secondary and sometimes even totally absent. From this flowed a series of unique landscape paintings in series. The first of which is the canopy series. And then another one, which was interested in the, the trees and the leaves and all of that from the floor to the tops of the trees. And then another series of riverbank series that was interested in the edges of the creeks, fallen branches and vines and debris and all of that. So this is one from the, I think the, it's from the creek series, but it's a huge exploration of light. We barely see the creek here. And he was interested in the light coming through the leaves and sometimes breaking through. And then sometimes the darkness and the reflection on the water and the color of the water with a few trees and, and branches and so on scattered by. And this is one from the, this is one from later from 1975, but it is typical of the Riverbank series with roots and leaves and debris um, next to a body of water. Now, all of this was an intellectual effort for slavery. It was not just sitting down and trying to paint. He had to make an, a, an effort to analyze and understand light. So here's what he said to me in 1993. Instead of taking the forest of the subject matter in total, in total, he started looking at the fundamentals of it, the details, the different light in the canopy and the light in the middle and the floor. So this was an, an intellectual effort. Now, here is another painting of the light and the trees and the background and foreground and the debris on the floor of the, of the jungle. This is another one. Um, you can barely see this is some rapids and some, uh, probably some vegetation here all in dark. And we can see 
other human figures are dwarfed. They're trying to like push a canoe over a rapid. You can barely see the canoe here. And we can see some human figures or what seem to be human figures here and the boiling water of the rapids here. Uh, these and other series were not just focusing on the hinterland teams. They involved a profound change in his vision, technique, and understanding. As he said to me in 1993, what I did was to seize on the subject matter, whether it was a Takuba or a portage or any of the interior things or places, he tried to get the essence of it into his painting. And here is another painting of light and water and trees and shadow. Okay, another effort to understand all of that. This is a Kamba painting from 1977, um, in which he goes back to depiction of landscape, uh, rocks and water. This is from Orange Juke. This is from a later series. This is another kind of painting that he got into, which I'll talk about later, in which he uses the painting in a more washed effect, in which you don't see any particular actual image um, or depiction of anything. Um, I don't have the details on this, but this could be one of what he called his aerial landscapes. Now, there was another development in his work when he moved now in 1964 to the Rupununi. Now, there was another development now dealing with space. And uh, these were paintings of scale. And when you look at these paintings, as Stanley Greaves observed, you could imagine the composition extending far beyond the frame of the painting. So this is the first one, the Rupununi landscape. And we could imagine this painting continuing on the left and on the right huge and on the top and on the bottom. So he was trying to capture space and scale here. And this is another one, the Savannah Wind. This is from 1979. Um, again, a range of mountains which could extend far beyond the picture and a sky which could also extend. So his effort here, we notice the same rough technique the scratches and the use of paint, the impasto technique with the overpainting and all of that. Another aspect of his technique that, he's, that he will develop later on is light, space, and color and texture, which were very, very important and very expressive in his work. Um, it is not just to, to depict the landscape, but to express the landscape. The human figure, as we said, was now totally, almost totally vanished. And the work was now focused on the land, the sky, the vegetation, water and rocks and all of that. The technique, the impasto technique was something that he learned from his early mentor, Burroughs, um, E.R. Burroughs, but also from somebody that uh, he met in Tate Yard, Dr. Tate, who was a psychologist and who had shown him um, pictures of that kind of technique, art technique being used in art therapy, the use of colors in, in a thick way. So that, that was another influence in his work. And um, also he said that um, once a canvas fell on the ground and picked up some sand, and so that happy coincidence led him to incorporate more texture into his work. And the scratching technique creates real texture. So we see real and simulated texture, actual and visual texture. But later on, uh, we will see that he uses a different technique where there's a lighter application of paint. And I'll just show you one painting. In this painting from 2014, a more recent paintings, you can see how different this one is with a very flat, painting, a wash of color, and then we have um, recognizable shapes and some unrecognizable shapes, suggested shapes, like paper cutouts floating on that surface. So this is a later technique from the scratchy heavy impasto technique to this kind of technique, which he used very much in St. Lucia.
Um, he was quite a technician, ways of using paint with on the painting and so on, which I will show you just now. Um, using the painting in full chromatic strength, the full, the full strength of the color. Now I'll show you one of his paintings and then I will go a little bit close into that painting to look at some of his techniques. So this is one of his paintings, um, Forest Path, Nightfall from 1996. Um, and we can get a little bit paint close into another painting. This is called Rainforest Evocation from 2012. So even though he was using that technique that I showed you in 2014 in St. Lucia, he was also using this technique, which we'll take a little closer look at. I hope you can see this. So this is the same painting here um, in close up. And so we can see the scratches, using the scratches there. Uh, we can see scratches here. We can see here we have thick use of paint. We have a thick set of paint, white paint, where the light is coming through. We have some white blobs of white paint. We have some red paint here. We have some dark red, thick paint. Now here we have some lighter painting. We have, we can see the brush strokes coming here and here and coming down here and then coming here with light, light wet painting, all of that being used. Here we can see different shades of green. We can see from this kind of green to this darker green, to this more yellowish green, to a whitish green, but not by mixing the color, but, but, but by painting and over painting and so on. We have some little outline shapes here in black, right along the way. And then we have here a patch of white, uh, over painting with white and then a dragging of the brush, a dry brush, a dragging of the brush so some of the paint sticks to the surface. All right. And then we have, so uh, here we have a dark area below the surface and we have a white that he just paints over that. So these are the kinds of techniques that he uses in his work, um, in his heavy um, impasto kind of technique. And this is what he started doing in the 1950s, 60s, and continued um, into, the, into the 2012, 2014, alongside his other lighter um, technique. Another one was the aerial landscape that I spoke about, where we have the kind of um, vap vaporous kind of use of paint, all right? Um, washes of color. This is not the best illustration of the, of the aerial landscape, <clears throat> but it comes close in the kind of um, technique and what kind of work he did in that, um, through that technique. Um, one thing that we noticed in St. Lucia is that while he continued his um, impasto, and, and, and continue the aerial landscape in terms of the washes and thinner use of paint. Um, he, the colors, I think, became brighter. He did not overpaint the colors, but he let them stand um, on their own. And so we're going to look at another one of the later works. Now, this is from 2010. Now, this work shows you the kind of bright color where there is almost no overpainting or underpainting or so on, but just the bright use of colors in areas and forms. And notice though the, how harmoniously he uses the colors, the cool blue, the green, and the contrast with the tones of red, different tones of red and different tones of green. So very good in composition. Another thing about this painting is that it is called the Kanji Edgar Mittelholzer. And this is one of the paintings that he did in homage to Edgar Mittelholzer, the Barbese Guyanese writer, the Guyanese writer from Barbese. And so he paints a picture related to the, the Kanji peasant um, in tribute 
to Edgar Mitchell Hall itself. Here is another later painting. Um, I think this is from 2012. There's a date at the bottom here. And this is again about interior landscapes, the kind of landscape that you would not see in St. Lucia, more reflective of, of a Guyanese kind of landscape. But I want you to notice the, the, the washes and the lighter use of color and how the human figure still remains kind of secondary. Okay, and the some of the same spattering and some of the <clears throat> lighter over painting. And again, the harmony, the purples and the oranges and the browns against the different greens and reds. Now, what I was telling you about his collaboration with Caribbean and Guyanese writers, he began that in 1982, what he called a spiritual collaboration with Caribbean writers. For example, um, he had an exhibition in Castellanos in 1996, which featured 16 paintings inspired by the, by the work of Ian MacDonald and by the poems, the collection of poems called Essequibo. He also created paintings influenced by Seymour, Martin Carter, Mitchell Halsey, as I just showed you, and also Naipaul, Walcott, um, Braffitt, and other persons from the Caribbean. 1996. So this is savory painting while Ian MacDonald um, is reading the It is Good to Look Up Great Rivers. That was the name of the poem. And he walked with a blank canvas and his paints. And while Ian MacDonald was reading the poem, this was the painting that he created. It, and it is called the same name as the poem. It is good to look out on great rivers. And we can see the little boat that he's painting there. Um, we can see the little boat here. And notice again how people are dwarfed, right? Now this painting was done in a wet, wet technique, uh, allowing the paint to um, spread out a bit. And so at the end of the poem, he completed the painting. He signed it here, Savory Run, Savory 1996 and he donated it to the National Collection. Okay, so, so the literary writers like uh, Naipaul and Mittelholzer and so on, he and MacDonald, he created paintings based on, on their works, but also the non-literary writers. And very important in this was the influence of Ivan van Sertima, which connected with Savory's quest for the true Caribbean. And van Sertima's work, they came before Columbus, published in 1976. Also the work of Lennox Honeychurch, the Caribbean people published in 1995. And um, all, of these, all of these historians, um, did they did the work to show him that they were pre Columbian civilizations existing in the Caribbean. And Seyfri was very much interested in this. And he also created a series of paintings called the Alphabet Bamoon, which I, I don't have an example to show you, in, but in which he, he explores the similarities between the African art and Amerindian art to further establish a connection between Africa and the Americas before Columbus. Now, this is one of the paintings. I don't have an actual painting, but a picture from the Sabbath News called Pre-Columbian Arrivals. And what we have here is an Afro man, which is um, natty hair and his goatee and his spear and probably his warishi. And we have the boats looking on at the, the boats arriving, okay? So this is called pre-Columbian arrivals. Another painting called Ancestral Echoes. Notice a radically different kind of painting um, showing the hunting activities of the pre-Columbian and, and later indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. Another painting is called Island Conquest. 
And here we find a, a, a war between, it's the painting is not clear, I lifted this from the internet. Um, we have an, a struggle here of Europeans and indigenous people on a large background. And the focus is on the, the fighting and the struggles and, and the conquest of the um, Caribbean islands and the, the South American mainland. Another painting, this is called Rock Art. This is from 1960 or 1961, showing again the use of the hieroglyphs and it looks similar to African rock art and rock art that you will find in other places in the world. So these are the, the pre-Columbian paintings, the paintings about the rootedness of the Caribbean and the prehistory of the Caribbean. So even when he left Ghana, he continued to be interested in all of those things. But the experience of Ghana was fundamental to all of this. He explained that the Ghanese hinterland is where the whole idea of my artistic experience really and truly began. I don't think there could ever be an end to the experience. I don't see the possibility of finishing with it. He told me that in an interview in 1993, and he continued doing all of that up to 2019. When he left Guyana, he was more satisfied with the Canopy series of works. So even while he was working, he was still not satisfied with his work. He was still on this quest to find this way, this um, more authentic way that Burroughs had spoken about. While in St. Lucia, his painting changed a little bit more to sceneries and so on. Um, the, the, the flora, the fauna, the vegetation. Uh, I don't have a name for this, but this was done in 2014 and it depicts um, in an almost realistic way, the Piton Mountains of St. Lucia. So the themes, the, the, the actual paintings, etc., slowly changed, but the quest did not change. The quest was there with him. Here is a later painting uh, of a Benab. And again, it's just a little painted in person there and another person there. Okay, the interest is in the land, the landscape. So I want now to turn to his contributions. He was among the first to use the motifs of the petroglyphs, but as I showed you earlier, not just a way of putting petroglyphs into his work, but by using it as a way of organizing his work. Other artists such as Greaves and Lunk had used the petroglyphs in this Guyanization period in the 1950s and 60s that I was talking about, but not just in the paintings, but in at Stanley Greaves had an, a, a letter in the newspaper recently in which he showed how he used this in stage design and all of that. Michael Jilks used it in his, in his drama in Kuvad in 1960, I think the Kuvad from 1960, um, and made it related it to the emergence of Guyana as a new nation. So we have all of these persons making use of the indigenous within the Guyanese tradition, um, but finding that probably they could not use it as genuinely as the indigenous people themselves could use it. Um, he was among the first, certainly, to make the hinterland landscape his subject. And as you, as you see, it continued right through his work, um, not just as a passing phase, but consistently. As he said, that, that was the foundation of his, of his artistic vision and all of that. Um, just for reference, there was an Armenian artist by name Eddie Fredericks, who was painting, doing paintings like these from the 1950s. Uh, a series of paintings in a realistic manner. Um, and then later on, there was Stephanie Coraya, um, who was using, who was painting from an Amerindian source. Of course, Stephanie is Amerindian. Um, and so she drew quite a lot from that. And then we had Ivan Forrester, who was a painter of the jungle, but not a prolific painter. And of course, we had Aubrey Williams, and then of course, George Simon and the Locono artists, all of these in the tradition of indigenous 
themes, motifs, ideas, but not just depicting it, trying to use it to show us some of our deeper roots and sources of our culture. So he changed the concept of landscape painting in Guyana. His work was close to abstraction, but not abstract. And with that, we can compare him with Ron Save, with uh, Aubrey Williams. And that, that could be the subject of another discussion, both passionate about American and Caribbean prehistory, and both engaged in spiritual collaboration with other artists, and interest in the hinterland, uh, which Williams was doing a bit more abstractly than Savory. Agnes Jones recalled Savory's passion for standards and so on. And he told me in 93 that he was always looking back and criticizing his work, always looking for um, improvement. And he was serious about his evocations and, and discussing about it. Um, he was a prolific artist um, doing huge work and collaborating with writers. Um, he was a true Guyanese. He was intrinsic and original to Guyana. He found something that was originally Guyanese in the interior landscape. He fulfilled Burroughs's argument of a more sincere and satisfying way of doing art in Guyana. And his interest in pre-Columbian art to find this original condition of these, of these lands. And in this drive, he reflected his personal histories Imagine doing all of that work before 1974 and then abandoning all of that to pursue art. And we know how, how difficult it is to pursue art um, in Guyana and the Caribbean. He left a rich store of artwork um, and he left also a way of seeing and responding to the landscape, which no one had done before or since. He helped to build a hopeful, valuable cultural space in Guyana, not only in the 1960s, but later on. And finally, part of his legacy is his passion for understanding and depicting the rootedness of the Caribbean and, through, and showing us um, the true history of um, these lands. In closing, I would like to thank Isabel for, as I said, setting me this task and keeping up with it and ensuring that during the COVID and all of that, we still got through with it. Um, Kiran doing the technical work and Joan the administrative work, Al for chairing and hosting this, uh, Mori House Trust for this series of talks, which adds to our cultural landscape, the National Gallery of Guyana for providing some of the artwork, the Rodrigues collection, I thought I saw Mistress Rodrigues in the audience, um, thank you for allowing us to get pictures of your collection. Nigel Hughes and a huge collection, thank you to them. And also you, the artist here in Guyana and abroad. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. And I hope that I have given you some taste of Ron Savory's work um, that could lead to some more appreciation of him and his work, could lead to some appreciation of the 1960s in Guyana and the continuing importance of the vision of the 1960s of that quest, which Ron Savory embodied, carried forward and championed, and um, which this talk pays tribute to in the month of his birthday. Um, thank you all uh, very much. I just want to say thanks to Alim for that really very valuable presentation. Uh, and uh, I think it's a, a, a deep contribution to the history of art in Guyana. And also the, the way Alim was able to concentrate on techniques, to focus on techniques that are important. Many of those techniques are important to savor his art and so on, the impasto, the use of the brush strokes and, and, and so on. And the, it, it is really a, 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 a lesson in Guyanese art, a lesson, a lesson in art itself, technically. And a number of things there which reminds me of some of the things I, I believe are notable about uh, Savory's art, which is his relation to Impressionism. And one can find some elements of Impressionism in, in what he was doing and the 
descriptions of the light, use of the light, and the leaves and, and, and the landscape, which are also linked to something that is important to many Guyanese, to not many, but a, a, a number of Guyanese artists, including Stanley Graves, which, which is the metaphysical. And um, the metaphysical, which is also related to some of the, the writers, the literary writers, writers to which they to which they link. And um, one thing that interested me coming out there was the Tate House, the, the Tate Yard, or the the, the 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 creative work taking place there, in particular, the theater that was taking place there. I know that um, I have seen mention of Philip Moore in the um, in, in, in that whole Tate um, activities of art. And persons who are here who are involved in that, like Graves and others. And uh, it is also interesting to note that we are joined in this discussion by people like John Robert Lee of St. Lucia, who is here with us and um, he is a poet and one who has been long involved in the arts in St. Lucia. So we have a St. Lucian link there in this, in this presentation. I already, I've already mentioned the presence of Stanley Graves who not only worked closely, knew Savory very closely, but was also a part of the many important movements that Alan touched on in his talk. So we have a, a rich assembly. We had a powerful uh, analysis of the art of Ron Savory. And we have a few minutes to engage in questions and answers. Um, Al, before you go to questions, could I, could I pull up something that was sent? Um, Jennifer Jure uh, sent some comments and corrections, which I'm grateful for, which I'd yeah. like to just um, share with the audience. Okay. <clears throat> um, Danny Savory, according to Jennifer Jure, Danny Savory, who, who I quoted, was Savory's niece, not his daughter. So I'm grateful for that, to correct the historiography. And the aunt that I was talking about, who became again a scholar, I'm grateful for this information. The aunt is Lillian Jor, who became the first local headmistress of Bishop's High School. Uh, so thanks to Jennifer for that. And the, the Pegasus Commission, according to Jennifer, he did complete the Pegasus Commission and those paintings were hung in what was then the new Western wing of the hotel. So if you have a chance to get into the Western wing of the hotel, you might be able to see some of the, some of Ron Savory's um, commission work there. So Jennifer, thank you very much. I will add that to the presentation that um, authenticates and, and gives better authenticity to the historical uh, factual background. Thank you very much. Over to you, Al. Yes, okay. And um, as we were talking about his Guyanese work, when I look at this sort of sort of forest, we're not forest, we're an island with all forests like Guyana, but I often thought that he, he, he transferred, in a sense, a lot of his, his sense of Guyana forest and the light coming through the canopies, in a sense, to, to the quote-unquote forest of St. Lucia. So there's much more light, whereas the Guyanese forest will be darker. Yes, there's light coming through, as you pointed out, Alim, but the, the, the St. Lucian sort of landscapes with sort of wooded areas, there's a lot more light coming through there. In fact, I've got a poem in, in a new book of mine dedicated to Ron, where I actually talk about that and see how he transposed, how he sort of collaged his St. Lucian experience in painting with the Guyanese. And you, so it'd be good for you, who I'm not a painter myself, who could analyze and see how perhaps the two, and I use the word collage a lot for him. Because I think finally, there's a painting you showed, Alan. I knew he used to do a lot of collages, um, okay. you know, cut out, he would cut out uh -huh. the piece and put them onto the painting. So I recall that there's a piece you had there, which looks like one of those. But I would have Looks, some yes. photographs I'm happy to share with, um, with somebody at some point. But thanks for the lecture. It's good to hear more about, about Ron and his contemporaries. I've been fortunate to know the Ken Corsby, the Mark Matthews, Clement Tate, you know, when I first came to Gans to Theatre Guild and Carrie Fester. So 
uh, I've been fortunate to have a lot of Guyanese writers and painters like Ron. And so it's been a good relationship for me with Guyanese <coughs> artists and, and other people. So just my, my two pens on this. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're part of the audience. Yes. And I read your tribute online. Ah, yes. And I, I'm, I'm, glad I took, I'm glad to get in touch with you because Wonderful. you seem to have been close to him, a close friend. Yes, and uh, for so many on. years. Uh -huh. When he first came yeah, to I, I, the 70s with an exhibition, I was able to help him set up the exhibition. First time I ever met him. Then he returned to St. Lucia and I would go visit him every now and then at his, at his various studios. And we did keep in touch. He loved um, Ivan Van Satima's work. He actually, I think, ordered many copies and he was giving them away or selling them in St. Lucia. So yeah. we used to have all these long chats, very intense, you know, about many things. Like um, him, I was a broadcaster for a while, so his interest in, in broadcasting <coughs> and jazz, all these things we, 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 we enjoy just chatting uh, um, about together, you know? He was a great friend and person. I wouldn't he, say he, he, chubby, chubby, I'm not chubby, one. chubby, chubby. But I enjoyed always meeting with him and just spending time okay. chatting and listening to him, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. He did mention in one interview that the St. Lucians found his paintings too dark. Oh, really? And so, yeah, Interesting. Yeah. I never and knew so he, he lightened up. They, they ah, like, they like perhaps when, when he was, first started. Kind of response to that. I because, see, you know, as an artist, he has to make a living. Of and course, of course, of course. Yes, 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 yes. The perhaps collages when you when mentioned. He first came. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably at the beginning, yeah. The yes, collages, but, yes. uh -huh. I looked, some of the paintings look like collages. Yes. So this is one world. of the difficulties working with mm -hmm. online things. You really can't see the right. work and look right. at the date and know what it is and all of that. Mm -hmm. But if you can test where the sure. collages and we can get... Yeah, there were collages, that, for sure, because I have written some poems to his work, right. ephrastic poems were responding to the art. And there were definitely um, collage pieces of birds I was working with. But we have actually come to the, the, the time when we should close the Q&A period. And um, I want to thank all those who participated, comments, questions, and, and, and so on. I want to thank you very much, as well as to thank Alan and for what was really a rich contribution to the history of art in Guyana. And I think we learned quite a lot, not only about Ron Savory himself, but about a number of other content, con contental things, other, other things which are related to his art and things that were illuminated by his art. <laughs> and I'm talking about both, both phenomena and the people, persons as, as well, who are, close, who are close to him and his work. So thank you very much. And at this moment, I hand you back over to Isabel Bikeri. Uh, just a final word of thanks to Al and particularly to Alem, of course, for this evening's talk. Um, and I couldn't agree more that it's very important to chronicle the work of our artists because in fact when we do that we are we're writing a chapter of our own history of our cultural history um, which is uh, vital.